Centralia is a borough and ghost town in Columbia County, Pennsylvania. Its population has dwindled from over 1,000 residents in 1981 to 12 in 2005, and 9 in 2007, as a result of a mine fire burning beneath the borough since 1962. Centralia is now the least populous municipality in Pennsylvania. John Athenforst opened Bull's Head Tavern in 1841 in what was then Roaring Creek Township. In 1854, Alexander W. Rear, a civil and mining engineer for the Locust Mountain Coal and Dime Company, moved to the site and laid out streets and lots for development. The town was known as Central Avell until 1865. There was another Central Avell in Schuylkill County, however, and the post office would not allow second and one, so Rear named his village Central Lear. Central Lear was incorporated as a borough in 1866. The anthracite coal industry was the principal employer in the community. Coal mining continued in Centralia until the 1960s, when most of the companies went out of business. Bootleg mining continued until 1982. Strip and open pit mining is still active in the area, and there is an underground mine employing about 43 miles to the west. The borough was also a hotbed of Molly Maguire's activity during the 1860s and 1870s. The borough's founder, Alexander Beer, was one of the victims of the secret order when he was murdered just outside of the borough on October 17, 1868. Three individuals were convicted of the crime and hanged in the county seat of Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania on March 25, 1878. Several other murders and arsons also occurred during this period. The borough was served by two railroads, the Philadelphia and Reading and Delhi Valley, with Delhi Valley being the principal carrier. Rail service ended in 1966. The borough operated its own school district with elementary schools and a high school within its precincts. There were also two Catholic parochial schools in the borough. The borough once had seven churches, five hotels, 27 saloons, two theaters, a bank, post office, and 14 general and grocery stores. During most of the borough's history, when coal mining activity was being conducted, the town had a population in excess of 2,000 residents. Another 500 to 600 residents lived in unincorporated areas immediately adjacent to Centralia. It is not known for certain how the fire that made Centralia essentially unlivable was ignited. One theory asserts that in May 1962, Centralia Borough Council hired five members of the Volunteer Fire Company to clean up the town landfill, located in an abandoned strip mine pit next to the Odd Fellows Cemetery. This had been done prior to Memorial Day in previous years, when the landfill was in a different location. The firefighters, as they had in the past, set the dump on fire, and let it burn for a time. Unlike in previous years, however, the fire was not extinguished. Other evidence supports this theory, as stated in Joan Quigley's 2007 missive, such as the fact that one of two trash haulers Curdy Stasilevich or Sam Devine dumped hot ash and or coal discard from coal burners into the open trash pit. The borough, by law, was responsible for installing a fire-resistant clay barrier between each layer that had fallen behind. This action allowed the hot coals to penetrate the vein of coal underneath the pit and subsequent subterranean fire. Quigley cites, interviews with volunteer firemen, the former fire chief, borough officials, and several eyewitnesses, as well as contemporaneous borough council minutes as her sources for this explanation of the fire. Six another theory of note is the bust theory. It states that the fire was burning long before the alleged trash dump fire. However, due to overwhelmingly contrary evidence, few hold this position and give it little credibility. The fire remained burning underground and spread through a hole in the rock pit into the abandoned coal mines beneath Centralia. Attempts to extinguish the fire were unsuccessful and it continued to burn throughout the 1960s and 1970s. Adverse health effects were reported by several people due to the byproducts of the fire, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and lack of healthy oxygen levels. In 1979, locals became aware of the scale of the problem when a gas station owner and then mayor, John Collington, inserted a stick into one of his underground tanks to check the fuel level. When he withdrew it, it seemed hot, so he lowered a thermometer down on a string and was shocked to discover that the temperature of the gasoline in the tank was 172 degrees Fahrenheit. Statewide attention to the fire began to increase, culminating in 1981 when 12-year-old resident Todd Domboski fell into a subsidence 4 feet wide by 150 feet deep that suddenly opened beneath his feet in a backyard. In 1984, Congress allocated more than $42 million for relocation efforts. 
most of the residents accepted buyout offers and moved to the nearby communities of Mount Carmel and Ashland. A few families opted to stay despite warnings from state officials. In 1992, Pennsylvania claimed eminent domain on all properties in the borough, condemning all the buildings within. A subsequent legal effort by residents to have the decision reversed failed. In 2002, the United States Postal Service revoked centrally as zip code 17927. Very few homes remain standing in Central Ear, most of the abandoned buildings have been demolished by humans or nature. At a casual glance the area now appears to be a field with many paved streets running through it. Some areas are being filled with new growth forest. Most of Central Ear's roads and sidewalks are overgrown with brush although some areas appear to be mowed. The remaining church in the borough which used to hold weekly Saturday night services remains silent in the bowels of Central Ear, and the borough's four cemeteries are slowly crumbling due to the carbon monoxide of the long-burning underground fire. Central Ear's cemeteries now have a far greater population than the town, including one on the hilltop that has smoke rising around and out of it. The only indications of the fire, which underlies some 400 acres spreading along fourth runs, are low round metal steam vents in the south of the borough, and several signs warning of underground fire, unstable ground, and carbon monoxide. Additional smoke and steam can be seen coming from an abandoned portion of Pennsylvania Route 61, the area just behind the hilltop cemetery, and other cracks in the ground scattered about the area. Route 61 was repaired several times until its final closing. The current route was a detour around the damaged portion during the repairs and became a permanent route in the mid-1990s. Mounds of dirt were placed at both ends of the former route, effectively blocking the road. Pedestrian traffic is still possible due to a small opening about two feet wide at the north side of the road, but this is muddy and not accessible to the disabled. The underground fire is still burning and will continue to do so for a predicted 250 more years. Prior to its demolition in September of 2007, the last remaining house was notable for the five chimney-like support buttresses along each of two opposite sides of the house, where the house was previously supported by a row of adjacent buildings before it was demolished. Another house with similar buttresses is visible from the northern side of the cemetery, just north of the burning, partially subsumed hillside. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania did not renew the relocation contract at the end of 2005, and the fate of the remaining residents is uncertain. It is expected that many former residents will return in 2016 to open a time capsule buried in 1966, next to the Veterans Memorial. This was a world where no human could live hotter than the planet Mercury, its atmosphere is poisonous as Saturn's. At the heart of the fire, temperatures easily exceeded 1,000 degrees. Lethal clouds of carbon monoxide and other gases swirled through the rock chambers. Quote from David Decott's book Unseen Danger, A Tragedy of People, Government, and the Centrally Mine Fire, 